Uh, we'll do a little self-organization here. Uh, I, I think that um, we'll try to be a little interactive and have uh, uh, questions along the way. The slides are numbered. When we get to number 19, we're done. Um, I hope that we get to number 19 before we uh, get to 5.30. We'll allow the other people to come in and do a presentation. So, so uh, I'm going to talk today about curriculum making for tribal learning, wayfaring along a meshwork of systems thinking. And in essence, the whole presentation is to explain those words. I'm not just making this stuff up. There are some basics behind it. Um, so experiences I have, my colleague uh, Susu Nosala is here. Uh, we're talking about experiences that we had with the Creative Sustainability Program at Alto University, which is, uh, for those of you who are local in Toronto, it is somewhat equivalent to the SFI program, but okay, at a different style, a different thing happen. Um, and I'll explain along the way uh, what, what we learned. So here's the agenda. Uh, first thing I'm going to talk about systems thinking at Alta University, and it starts off in 2010, and then it goes to 2016. Um, neither uh, Susu or I, she actually, she supposedly lives in Helsinki, but she's uh, flying on a plane a lot these days, so uh, we're, we're not, another one of us is residing there. Secondly, I'm going to bring up this idea of what we're calling trifle learning. Uh, and I'll explain what that means. And then third, I'm going to talk about the idea of curriculum making. Uh, these slides will be available on my website. Um, you can search on David A. You can find it. I'm a little bit behind. You haven't put them up yet, but they will be up there in a day or two. So let's go back to 2010. Uh, what happened in 2010? There, a very interesting thing happened at Alto University, which used to be when I started um, at the university, um, PhD student. Uh, it was at Helsinki University of Technology, better known as TKK, and they had a design school and then a business school. And the university took three, uni it took three universities and merged them. Okay, so can you imagine doing that here? So of course, the OCAD and uh, say Waterloo and engineering and you know they had a, you know, a program in business you know, like, Okay, we're gonna take all those three and make them one university. The purpose was to be an innovation university. Now, coincidentally, what happened at that same time was there was this approval for this program called the Create Sustainability Program, a master's program, and the way they said was rethinking architecture, business design, landscape planning, real estate, and urban planning. Um, people often ask what creative sustainability means. Uh, if you've been around Finland long enough, you should discover that Finns put together words that I'm not sure if they mean anything in Finnish or they mean anything in English, but no one knows what it is, and then five years later go, oh, the Great Sustainability Program, it's a great name, and, and they start using these words in other programs around the world. So I'm not sure what Great Sustainability means, but that's kind of description. So uh, Finns being very good at, uh, at following rules, um, as part of the approval of to have this new program put, in the EU, the EU requires two courses in system thinking. And so fine, they put two courses in system thinking, it takes like three years to get the program approved, they have it all approved, and then it's like, um, what's system thinking? No problem, they'll find someone that knows something about system thinking. Um, there was actually someone who was teaching the course in system thinking uh, at, at, uh, in the engineering department, and he says, Firstly, I teach it all in Finnish, and secondly, if I could do it with a design student, it's going to be too much work. So, my students called me, get this guy David Inga call, see if he wants to do it. So, I said, okay. So, um, I, I said, okay, I'll come and do it. And I'm now familiar with the Finnish style, which is um, they're not scared of trying things out that are new. And what you do is you correct along the way. So, I wrote huge reading lists. Um, and uh, but essentially, this, this is a pretty really interesting program. Uh, from a design standpoint, this is a university program designed without a center. So you've got um, these programs, which are, you can get an MA in, in design, which is from the Legacy um, Design School. You can get an MSc in business. You get a, a Master of Science in Engineering, or you can get a Master of Science in Real Estate. Now, not only do you do that, but you end up with these credits trying to go across the university. How many courses do you need to take? And so depending which faculty you're in, there's a big number of credits you to qualify and have a degree. But there were six to 10 credits that were compulsory across all of the courses. So the design students are coming in, 
um, and uh, they have 32 credits, and uh, uh, JP over here was in the business program, so we have more credits to do than the design students. But that doesn't mean it's not easier, is it? More work, less work, it doesn't make a difference, right? It's all, it's all good work. So, so um, they have these 610 credits, and within those 610 credits, what do you teach students coming across from all those faculties, and how do you do this, and how do, how do, you, uh, how do you get them to work together? So, uh, two system thinking courses were launched in 2010-2011. Uh, these are available, uh, so in, in 2011, for the uh, meeting of the International Society of System Sciences, I wrote up a report. So you can actually read about how the, the system thinking was, uh, courses were created, what the content was, um, and uh, I'm gonna be doing the same thing for this paper and describing what it is that we did and what changed. But in 2010, we taught the courses, um, and uh, all the course materials, I'm going to um, I'm a big open source advocate, so all the course materials are still available on the website. We didn't actually put them on the university website, because I can manage my own websites, and plus uh, universities, they change things over time, and I want things really stable. So um, if you want to see what the courses were in 2010, you can go back and look at them. You can compare to what they are now. So, what happened? Um, in 2010-2011, I taught these two courses. Um, and it was a really interesting experience because um, we were taking this lightweight style where we're kind of learning stuff to go along. So, I'm working with, uh, with Aya, uh, who's an experienced professor, and I worked with Kat, who eventually took over the course, and uh, kind of going through and going, okay, we've got this reading list, here's the content. Well, no one can ever read this reading list. Not that you should actually go through that reading anyway. Uh, we need to schedule exercises, we need to schedule breaks, we need to schedule you know, things. So there are some things that we did that were um, unconventional, uh, to say the least. Um, so one of the things um, that I did was, uh, since I'm not a real academic and I don't really go to university very much, I, I have this thing about homework, which I really don't like homework, where the only people that ever read the writing are the student and the instructor. So what I wanted the students to do was walk. Uh, you know, go, go to wordpress.com, I want to see you blogging in public. And you just learned a little bit from that, you don't have to blog under your own name. But just as long as I can find a blog, we don't want to be identified with it, that's fine. But the idea of people writing in public, it's a student, you know, and, and what actually happened was at that point I was doing a little more work uh, online, and, uh, and uh, I just created another community, and we had people from Argentina then commenting on students' blogs and videos. Because there's no reason you can't do that. It's not hard to do. You just need to decide you want to do it. So uh, anyway, we taught the first two courses, made it through the first two courses, and uh, the original plan was that I was going to teach another year and then hand it off to my friend. Well, I was working at IBM. Uh, I was 80% at IBM, and IBM uh, manager said, we want you back at 100%. So can't give up my day job. Told them, sorry, you know, I have to drop this course. Got my friend Gary to pick up the course. Um, and so then it worked on it, and actually, I, I go back to Finland every year and, and give a lecture, but I wasn't very involved with the program. And the involved program, um, just, do you want to talk about this a little bit and just describe it? Well, okay. part, part of the, yeah, creating <coughs> sustainability. So, um, in fact, uh, yes, yeah, so it involved because, as David said, the first 2010, right? 2010. So 2010, they put the, uh, the program into action, and they did the, uh, Systems part first, right? Yes, yes. So that was uh, like a gun, boom, you know, like, oh, and we, you know, nearly lost all our student base, really. Um, they digested it, we learned, but then it evolved into this structure where we have the creative teamwork process first. They really get to know each other. Remember, these people, it's a horizontal program, so they're coming from all over the university and they're working together, so they have to get to know each other. They, sort of, they learn how to do create a team building, all of that. And then these are the core. You have to do these core. So then they come to creative mindset. That's where I come in. And I have to come in and I have to see what their mindsets are and prepare them in a stealth manner for systems so that they can be malleable enough to absorb and cry and carry on and blood, sweat and tears and involve through that process with David. So it's a bit of a bad cop, good cop thing. They don't like me very much. That's fine, that's my job. 
I push them so that they get comfortable with being uncomfortable. They think I'm horrible, then they get dated. And they come back to me and say, help. Okay, so that's really the process. And it, it actually really brings the student together. It's, it's meant to bring them together so that they're really working as a team, understanding how to share, to dialogue, and actually do that, what's that weird thing? Discourse? Yeah, okay. So that's what happens. Um, and that was really an important process to, to go through. So David and I finally got together in this, and it was coming along very nicely this year. So we had, we got it to a point where it was actually quite smooth and flowing. So that's pretty much where we came in and worked together this year in 2016. Right, so um, the, uh, I, I, we had a, um, a, a System Thinking Ontario meeting. I had a student come on and say, oh, I saw your videos, I saw that kind of sort of stuff. And, um, and I've been accepted in the Career Sustainability Program. I started in the fall. And uh, I said to her, um, to be fair, the program you apply to is not the program you would be taking. So I actually don't know what's happening in the program, but the people who were involved in the past five years are not involved. So uh, Susan and I are working for um, moving this content um, in another way. So you'll see this popping up somewhere. But in essence, we've, we've kind of got this thing down now where first creative teamwork, you have engineers, designers who've never worked with each other. Uh, you've got business people. How could they possibly talk to each other even? Um, the second, the mindset. What, what does it mean to be sustainable? What does it mean? Can you, can you get that feeling? It's just a thinking one, we're orienting that more towards methods, system thinking two is more towards theory, and then trying to bring it all together in a continuous transformation framework. Okay, so this is also on the website from February 2016. Um, these are the, uh, this is the entire course that we gave the students. Now, you're looking at this probably the same way that um, students are. The way the finished courses go is they do intensive courses. And so um, I could come in and teach for three weeks, but there was some prep work up in advance and we took the coursework in advance. So, um, so I have this all laid out and you can go look at the course content, I have it. And, uh, and so uh, Susu was in, in Finland at that time, so I asked Susu, can you teach the class for me? Um, and so um, do you want to tell them about the reaction they had when they saw this stuff? Well, we have a we have a one of our wonderful students here. Actually, you know, he's having a crash course with us and continuing his learning by coming along. But I do remember introducing what we were going to do. This is it. We put it up, and this, I was at the front, so I'm looking at all the faces, and it's like horror. And you know, the feedback the whole time was, yeah, but it's so ugly. It's really hard. It's really hard to read. I said, okay. We start discussing this. And I tried to get them to explain you know, what's the problem, but can you get the information? No, it's not pretty, but can you get the information? Can you work out what to do? Can you make the effort to engage with this regardless of how ugly it really is? Knowing full well what I wanted to say, I waited till David got to film. <laughs> So I get to Finland, and, and by this point, um, the, the students are, I, so you have to look at this reading this. It's really entertaining people who um, actually do are in this community, because this actually goes back to about 2008, uh, when, when, when we're working um, in the International Federation of Systems Research, we're actually asking the question, what would a system course that covered pretty well everything that Kyle Power wants to do have? And so there's like, there's like, you know, 12 to 20 readings for each one of the weeks. And we don't expect anyone to read it. We really don't expect everyone to read it, but if some people read some of it and then other people read some of the other stuff, you get a dialogue going, right? So, so I, I, I go and talk to the students, and you know, by this point they're really annoyed because they're having to do all this reading and they've done all this preparation work. And so, okay. um, I understand that um, you people were disappointed at, uh, at the way this looks. Like, this is raw HTML. Like you guys are probably going about the dawn of the internet is how people wrote stuff, right? You know, couldn't we have done something like with cascading style sheets or beta or something like that? So I have this question. How big is your system? I've given you this reading list now. How big is your system? How big do you think? Oh, we think pretty big. Oh, so um, you know, so if you were going to do this, you would do this differently. Yes, we would make it prettier, we would make it even more accessible. Uh, we have this and we have that. I said, okay. 
Is your wife's website accessible from China? Can you read the content from inside the Chinese firewall? Now, Tusu is in Shanghai. This is really entertaining. People have never, know, that have never been in China. Uh, what this means is that Google does not exist in China. Yahoo barely exists in China. Facebook does not exist in China. We can read this website. So how big is your system? That's where you start off. And so now they get, oh, okay. Mm. So, yeah. <coughs> uh, the students uh, were asked to prepare, and there's, uh, there's a way of doing this, but they had three weeks after Susu uh, gave them the instructions, and what I did was they did the lectures. You've got this reading list, you've got so out of eight weeks, so we've got team five, six students maybe, you've got 20 readings, eight years ago, you guys have three weeks to prepare, you are leading the class. I'm not leaving the class now. If you, if you get in trouble, I'll bail you out. I do know the content. But it's up to them to read that content. And not only do they, they so there's one team assigned to, uh, to do the, the lecture, and then there's two who are assigned to be critics with a dialectic. And so that means they don't have to prepare, but they should probably just read the titles of the list and make an abstract or few. So when someone actually gives you a lecture on viable systems model, it's like, or BSM, what's BSM? Oh, the Bible is small, I've heard about that. And so then they would go and they'd, and they'd actually ask intelligent questions, like you're asking a lot of, like how does this work? How do you do this? How do you do that? And sometimes uh, the students get an appreciation of what's going on. So at the end of the course, here was the requirement, which now everyone had taken eight, we, eight, eight, um, there were eight modules, everyone studied everything. And I can't remember one remained in the group. But what we would do is, uh, I want people to create an infographic of what they learned about systems thinking. Not just on what you learned in your own eighth, uh, on your one eighth of the course that you, that you created, but some people actually picked up other things. And so, um, we had all these students, and they did this in 72 hours, so this is a funny thing because I, 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 I believe in putting this stuff online, and so it goes up quickly. And so uh, Peter Jones says, how long do the students have to work on this? I said, 72 hours. He says, but when we do the syn uh, synthesis map, so they do it in five, six weeks, they struggle. And when people do giga mapping, it's like you know, ter multiple terms that are doing that. I said, yeah, but th uh, this is not a course. Most of the students here are not going to be professional system thinkers. You can't get the degree in system thinking. You have to know the concept, and different things resonate for different people. And so giving people more time to work on more stuff doesn't help. But just make it merciful. All I want to know is I want you to create an infographic about what you learned, what, what, what struck you in the class. And here's the requirements. I forgot what the dimensions were going to be. It's like, okay, you know, I have to do it in 4,000 pixels by 6,000 pixels and let them lose for 72 hours. And so they came back with them. And they're pretty interesting uh, because you have to remember that these are all students, 30-some students that all took the same course, but they don't come down with one single view of what is system thinking. And that's part of the best part about what we got through the course. So this can be done. OK, trito learning. What is trito learning? OK. Um, there is a question about known unknowns. So, so there are no knowns in science, but the world's changing, and we have an issue with collective learning. Okay, um, there is, this is the original one for, for people that thought that Donald Rumsfeld invented known, you know, unknown known stuff like that. It actually goes back to um, actually this is my reference. But this goes back to the College of Medical Ignorance. And the College of Medical Ignorance, what they were trying to do is, to tell, is get doctors to appreciate they don't know everything. And so there are things that you know, things you don't know. Uh, errors, errors are really interesting. The only way you can detect an error is someone else has to tell you. You can't be an error if you're talking to yourself all the time. You know, I'm right, I'm always right. I'm only right in my brain, but it's not that you're wrong. Um, so um, we'll go through taboos and denials. Um, one of the questions we have in the systems engineering community 
was, you know, what is system thinking, what's the meaning philosophically? And this was a separate paper that I wrote well, uh, that separates out epistemy, technique, and prosthesis. And the way to think about these are learning why, learning how, and then learning when, where, and whom. These are different ways of thinking. And when we're talking about the way that the, the universities work and the way the world works, and these go back to Aristotle, um, there's a lot of focus on epistemology, knowledge, knowing stuff. Um, in design, there's actually a lot on technique, on technique, working on things collaboratively. Phronesis is, a, is about pragmatic action, and how does, how, does, how does change in the world impact other people? So if you are going to do system change, system change has an impact. You should be focused on phronesis. And Aristotle said that phronesis was the most important, not epistemic or technical. <laughs> So, what is trito learning? This is um, Gregory Bateson's model, um, and uh, we deal with uh, the, the way that we normally talk about this is in terms of uh, Bateson's research with dolphins. So, we have zero learning, which I'm on the chart. You have a dolphin, you want to give them a cracker to do a trick, they, they don't do it. They don't hit the cracker, they don't do a trick. Zero learning. Okay? Uh, you do proto learning. Total learning, you get the dolphin, you give them a cracker, they do the trick. You give them the cracker, they do the trick. They learn how to do proto learning. Level one. Level two, deuteral learning. You want the dolphin to do different tricks. So the dolphin does the trick, give them a cracker. Dolphin does the same trick again, you don't give them a cracker. Dolphin thinks, oh, don't see what say. Does the same thing again. No. Does it again? No. Now he gets mad and he just acts out and jumps out of the water. You give him a crack. So if the dolphin is smart and it proved that most of them were, they actually figure out that they can that they can actually get rewarded for doing new tricks, not the same trick over and over again. Bateson had a third level called trifle learning, um, and this is a different environment. So we have to take the dolphin out of the tank and put it in the ocean. Could the dolphin do tricks in the ocean as well as in a tank, in a lake, all these sorts of different situations? This is the thing that, this is the value we see behind system thinking. We want people to get to the trifle learning level. This is, um, I don't know how many people we want going there. So this, this is an interesting challenge now because being a trifle learner means you're actually pretty disruptive to the world, right? So we have to be careful about what we say about system thinking and, um, and how far we want people to go. And there's this idea of T-shaped people that has come up recently. This is what, some of the work on surface science, where and you get the idea of depth in one or multiple fields and then the crossbar crossing a boundary crossing. But a lot of the focus on T-shaped work is at the individual level. How do we create individuals that are T-shaped? What we should be thinking about is how do we create teams that are T-shaped? Multidisciplinary teams that work together. And this is the situation that we have in the British Canadian program. We have business people, we have engineers, we have designers, and we have them working together. Okay, slide 14. Whoa. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about um, reflecting on what is it that we did. This is the nice thing with the This is a finished file. You do stuff and then you figure out what is it we did, <laughs> right? Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm leaning a lot on the work of uh, Tim Ingold, who is a ecological anthropologist. And if you haven't read or seen anything of Tim Ingold, go to YouTube. I encourage you to, to do it. Um, and for those of you who are systems people, how many people know Gregory Bateson or heard of Gregory Bateson? Okay. How many people have heard of Gene Lane? Etienne Wenger, Communities of Practice? Okay. So, Tim Ingold is the only person I've read that cites Bateson and Gene Lane. And goes through every philosopher, goes through Heidegger, goes through Bourdieu, and it's really cool. So, the shifts that I see in the way we think about education, there are a couple of major shifts. I'll just go across it quickly here. 
Um, the idea of shifting from cognitive science to phenomenology, um, ecological and practice theory ways of looking at the world. Uh, for those of you, um, people have heard the word affordance. Affordance comes from J.J. Gibson and, and Ingold based his stuff on affordances. Okay? And it's not Don Norman's definition of affordances, because Don had to think of his language later, now uh, Don helped the signifiers, right? Uh, but um, there's an idea about animals and how they perceive the environment. And that's the, in that we have the idea of getting away from cognitive science and moving towards phenomenology and different ways of looking at the world. Um, there's a really interesting idea about the difference between transport and wayfaring. Uh, there's a, a very interesting article comparing the maze and the labyrinth. A maze is a multi personal structure. When you go into a maze, there are multiple ways in, there are multiple ways out, and you can get lost in a maze. A labyrinth, there is one way in, there is one way out. So if it's a maze, it's a labyrinth, why, why would anyone care about a labyrinth? So actually, this labyrinth over at um, um, Church of the Holy Trinity, the labyrinth there is straight on the ground, right? Why would anyone care? Like, there's no challenge there, right? It's because it's part of the experience of being in the labyrinth, right? So you're experiencing stuff, it's perception of the environment. It's not that you are separate, but you are together. And this, this is where the Bateson stuff starts getting to be really interesting, because Bateson doesn't think about the person and the environment. The person and the environment are one system. They're all together. So wayfaring <coughs> is the idea that you have a child, you're walking to school in the morning, and Kids looking around. That's how they learn, right? They're looking around and seeing all the world. So we've actually had a great wayfaring um, couple of days here. Uh, my, my friends here have been staying at my house, and so we've been biking from uh, Riverdale over here. And so you know, every day we experience the traffic, we experience uh, you know all the all the congestion, we see who's on the streets. But that's wayfaring. That's not a destination sort of thing. The third is this idea about networks and meshwork. Tim Ingold has, uh, has written quite a few books, and you see the link on YouTube, also on what he calls lines. Um, he did his work on anthropology and studying the Sami, which are the northern Finnish people. And so what he says is the Sami, and actually Inua too, uh, is the difference between a point and a line. So if you are in the snow, you're in the middle of nowhere, right? you are a point. You don't really exist. You're dead until you move. When you move, you create a line in the snow. And that is something that is both in time and in space. And what happens is that in our lives, we all have lines. And our lines intersect at certain points in time. And then they break away, and they come back together. So I found Tim Ingold's um, thinking about this to be really wonderful. Yes. What slide am I to now? Number 17. Good timing. I'm the last slide. Okay, so the last one, um, based off in Gold's work, uh, we have this idea of how, what does it mean to teach? So it's one idea of sequencing pedagogical content, which is what often some people do, or you have the idea of curriculum making. So making, as in the maker's community, making with your hands, critical making, there's this crossover now, not just about cognition of thinking about things, but actually making. So the question is, if you get the opportunity to teach a class, what is it you're doing? Are you trying to pass a representation of your knowledge onto someone else? Or are you trying to create an environment where you get an education of attention? Education of attention is a really interesting concept. That's what education is about. So when I'm teaching systems thinking, right, I have all these students, they're all presenting, and what, what happens is that usually they get the content right, but what happens, I get up afterwards and say, pay more attention to this part, pay less attention to that part. Because, you know, there's been all these debates, debates and disputes about that, but that's where the expertise comes in when you get someone who's really master those knowledge. So, as promised, thank you for um, self-organizing with me. And, uh,